This is Swarfcast. I'm Noah Graff. Hi, everybody. Jose Palomino, founder of Value Prop and your host on Business Growth on Purpose. Our guest today is involved in the buying and selling of used precision machining equipment. He's also a podcaster talking to manufacturers all day. And he has some interesting perspectives on how to make life and business work for you. His name is Noah Graff, and he is joining us right now. Welcome, Noah, to Business Growth on Purpose. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, Noah Graff, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about what you do and who you do it for? Sure. Well, I have several uh, several things I do. I'm a, uh, number one, I'm a machine tool dealer. I buy and sell um, capital equipment specifically for precision machining, for turn parts. Um, and uh, I also have a a blog uh it's called today's machining world and a podcast called swarfcast where we talk to more or less our customers um the people we sell machines to uh and we learn about you know all of their challenges running manufacturing businesses wow well that's that's one of the reasons we're excited to have you on on the show here noah because you know that's that's kind of a window into a world that many of our listeners and, and candidly, many of the client base I work with is usually that, that owner led business very often in manufacturing of some sort. So just a couple of questions. I mean, clearly the last three years have been a little, you know, crazy, right? So as we get, we have to move forward. Now we're in, in 2023. What do you see or what are you hearing? And this could be, you know, either through your sales process or as a result of your podcast where you're directly interviewing people. What are some of the things you're hearing that people are concerned about or particular challenges in the manufacturing world kind of kind of ear to the ground what do you what, what's coming up okay it's very interesting and i will not talk for all manufacturing i'm only going to talk for precision machining parts manufacturing okay um so i mean if you trace back uh the pandemic you know when the first pandemic when when it first hit um you know, everybody was in the house of pain. It was like the worst year for Graf Pinkert. We had to get PPP money. Um, and then, uh, and people started laying people off, um, you know, our customers. And then everything just kept, kept, just started roaring back, just raging. People needed more people. They needed more material. They had more business than they could do. And it was crazy. Um, so, then it went from the worst year for us to our best year. Um, the last two years have been our best years. And for a lot of our customers, they've been their best years. So now we're getting into a certain murky area. And it's interesting because I feel like there's somewhat of a, a disconnect between wall street and the fed and our world of machining um granted it's all connected and it all trickles down um right now most of our customers have more work than they can handle okay they still need more people um they still need more machines but you know things um things trickle down and people do talk about it they do talk about interest rates and maybe they're not going to buy another uh machine this year maybe um you know maybe they're going to not buy the next building or whatever but i mean so what i'm seeing is expanding 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 i said that to a dealer friend uh the other day who was sort of getting a little more nervous he's like yeah you know i'm seeing maybe some people selling stuff and whatever and i said well everybody all our customers seem to be hot and he's like well those are your customers they're the ones that are really successful that's why they're buying machines and i said well <laughs> that's true 
So it's hard to know, but what I'm saying is I'm seeing positivity. I'm seeing a little bit of healthy, uh, you know, being on guard. Um, but you know, you have people always need parts, right? And there's reshoring people from China, you know, right. A lot of the, a lot of the jobs that people would send to China, they're just, they're taking the ones here. So that's another thing. Um, why people need machines. Well, what, one interesting thing though, that I've observed and, and I've talked to, you know, business owner conferences and things. And, and I asked this question in this kind of like upswell boom past, you know, it was like a Valley, right? Like things went really quiet. Then they bang, like you said, roaring back, you said, uh, but I also challenge, especially small businesses, you know, smaller in, in, in the relative scale, um, has all that business coming back been profitable or have you found that you're actually, you know, you're paying overtime, having to hire people much higher than you expected to hire them, et cetera, you know, all those things. So it's kind of like, um, what was it about a year and a half ago, every used car dealer in America thought they became marketing geniuses overnight. Right. Because it's just, you know, the rising tide. Right. So, so I wonder, are, are you hearing anything from, folks in, you know, running these manufacturing operations, that they're concerned about long-term profitability. Is it the right business? Or are they just saying yes, because it was kind of quiet for a while and scary. So now it's like, oh yeah, I'm not turning anything away. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, and there's obviously there's inflation, there's, <clears throat> um, I think people are, are profitable. I think again, they wouldn't be buying machines um, if they weren't. Um, and it's actually it's been really good, just like for used car dealers. It's been really good for a used machinery dealer because a lot of the new machines are just sold out. You just it's like a six month or even a year. So it's not necessarily a, a preference for used for some financial reason. It's like you can make a machine available to me in thirty days brand new, which might've been what I started with, won't be available for six yeah, months. It's both. It's both. Okay. okay. Um, okay. You know, it's, so I think people are profitable. I haven't heard anybody tell me, oh, I'm spinning my wheels. I'm not profitable. Okay. I, I think, you know, I think this trickle down stuff and I think it's just, nobody likes uncertainty. Um, and, you know, I remember before the, the 2016 election um everybody it was uh, business sucked it was it was horrible nobody was buying machines and after the election was over it was like a switch was flipped all of a sudden everybody started calling wanting machines whether that was because of who won or not i don't know it might have had something to do with it, but i also think it's just they don't even it doesn't even matter who wins they just want they just want certainty. They just want right. to know something is there and then they'll go and start buying equipment. And they can plan accordingly. Once you know, it's when everything's up in the air, it's like, how do, how do you plan? Do, do I plan? <laughs> how do I expand? Sure. How do I even feel confident hiring or not hiring? You, you, you're always in that state of like flux almost. And absolutely. And, and, and Which every... is interesting though, because you figure during the pandemic, it's a period of uncertainty yet their, you know, business is great. So it, it's hard to- Well, that, that kind of dovetails to something we talked about in our in our pre-show conversation. And, and I, I like to just spend a little time with this, no, because I think it's interesting. Um, because some of that you could say, well, gee, then it's really just all up to, you know, the, 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 the winds of time will take me this way or that way, right? So often you could refer to that as good luck or I think the term you use serendipity, right? So- Sure. Uh, and I know you've been thinking about that a little bit more in just terms of just like how, you know, one is we're just subject to it or two is a more active perspective where I can actually start shaping some of that good fortune by things I do or don't do. Exactly. So I, I think that's really yeah. fascinating, and especially in a world of like precision machining. And so you don't normally think of that as being, you know, towards that. But if you could just comment on that a little bit, I'd like to hear. Sure. That. Sure. Okay. So selling machine tools, um, you know, half of it is the buying, maybe, maybe more than half of it is the buying, finding stuff. So you're constantly trying to buy and sell and you're, you're, you call somebody up 
um, or you, you go visit somebody's shop and, uh, and you, you come there looking for one machine and it turns out that machine sucked. You don't even want it. And then you see this other machine in the corner that it's like, you had no idea they had. And then they're like, wait, you're, you're interested in, in that. And you're like, well, maybe I could be interested in that. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden you find this thing that's way better than what you came for. Um, and so, you know, you can break it down to, to various things of keeping your eyes open for, for things uh, when you're, when you're trying to find luck. I, I, I interviewed this guy. He, he came out with this amazing book last year. It's called the serendipity mindset. The guy's name is Christian Bush. And he wrote this book about all these different things you can do to find, to, to, you know, to find luck in your okay. life and in your business. So for instance, if you're a machinery dealer um, or, or doing any kind of sales call or introducing yourself, to somebody, there's what he calls a serendipity hook. So for instance, if somebody asks you what you do at a party, first of all, it's probably not the best thing to introduce yourself by asking what you do. It's sort of like an evaluation thing, but whatever you, you don't say, uh, you know, hi, I'm Noah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a machinery dealer. First of all, nobody's going to know what the heck you're talking about. If you say I'm a machine, <laughs> they'll say, oh, that's interesting. They'll go, oh, OK. <laughs> now, a hook is where you include other information into what you're saying. So you could be like, yeah, well, you know, I'm a machinery dealer and um, I also happen to have a podcast and, um, you know, I'm an avid salsa dancer and, you know, I, I've been salsa dancing for for 20 years and et cetera. So now you've given like four different different hooks, different nodes to start a whole conversation. So say you're calling somebody on the phone about a machine. Um, hey, do you have X? Well, no, I, I don't have that. And you say, well, look, um, we also, our, our company, Graf Pinkert, we're, we're starting to, to do like business brokering. So I say, well, look, I'm on the phone with you. We also do this. We also buy and sell companies. You know, do you know of anybody uh, looking to to buy a company or sell a company? Boom. All of a sudden, you call for one thing and you find something maybe totally better. Okay. So that's that's one thing uh, that I learned from, from this guy. It's one way to find serendipity. Another way to find serendipity is what he calls serendipity bombs. So okay, that sounds interesting. Serendipity bombs. Serendipity bombs is cool. So, like you say you need to get something. Um, you're say you're I don't know, you're say you're a podcaster like me, mm -hmm. and you're looking to uh get you know some awesome people on your podcast, you know, sort of dream guests, as they say. Right. You send you know, you think of like the six people that could maybe help you the most. And you, you send these Hail Marys out to them. You send six of them out. And, you know, you never know. Maybe, you know, if you send six of them, you wouldn't, you might be surprised. Maybe one or two actually come back. And if you didn't actually just try, just throw out these things. You know, I, I had a guy yesterday or last week. He, he bought this, um, screw machine a swiss screw machine from me he uh actually he made he was this guy in idaho he made rifles and he he contacted me about a machine on our website and it wasn't even a machine that it wasn't even the right model it was a model that was smaller than the one he needed and so i i talked to him and i was i was so disappointed i was like oh shit we've been trying to get rid of this machine for like three years we bought it at an auction it was horrible and um and then i was like all right well i'll keep my eyes open and then i thought about it and i was like wait a second that you know last week my friend randy he was asking me about he was another dealer and he was he said oh i have this machine what should i do about it you know and i was like well 
oh, I don't know, maybe you should get rid of this machine. Maybe it's not very good or whatever. And then I thought to myself, the next day after the guy from Idaho called, I was like, oh, wait a second. That's the machine Randy has. Called up Randy on the phone. Randy's like, yeah, I still have it. I was like, well, what kind of deal can you give me? Oh, you know, I'll, I'll sell it for you X, you know, I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, 10% off. Called the guy in Idaho back. He's like, I'll take it. Done. And it doesn't always happen like that. But no, but you but you 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 kind of uh, realize, I mean, and I'm sure you've been in business a long time. You no, know, so I'm sure you've realized this before. But like the question you the request you don't make is an automatic no. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, you see people who are I know people, they talk a little too much. Some some dealers are very like they'll just they're like the town crier. They'll say everything, right? And some dealers are like really hold it to the vest. You know, you don't want to tell any of your secrets, whatever. Right. And sometimes the people that are the most talkative that I, I question a little bit. Maybe you shouldn't be saying quite so much. But then by sharing all that information, all of a sudden something comes out in the conversation. Right. Um, and if you hadn't said anything because you're so suspicious of that or a person, nothing would have happened. And there's something called, uh, there's this other guy I love to study. His name is Robert Cialdini. He wrote, I don't, I don't, he's a social psychologist. And one of the things he talks about is reciprocity. So if you tell somebody else some secret that maybe they shouldn't, you shouldn't tell them, then maybe they'll tell you the secret okay. back that maybe they shouldn't tell you, shouldn't tell you. Which is another, I think it's sort of another serendipity kind of thing where the more things you have out in the open, the more likely you're gonna, you know, maybe this magic is gonna happen. Well, do you find, Noah, it, it kind of in connection with that, what comes to mind is at least what I've experienced in, in all the years of coaching people trying to do ramp up their sales or their business development activities. I said, you know, oftentimes the most powerful thing is being uh, one, you're talking about transparency, but being a little bit vulnerable and asking for help. And yes. I find a lot of people just, as, you know, I mean, there are like, let's face it, there's some rotten people in the universe, but there's a lot of good people that would uh, would prefer to be helpful if they could. That is uh, totally true. And, uh, and people, people often want to help. It's, it's, it's incredible. They, 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 they get this sort of feeling inside that oh you value me you you want me to teach you and by them doing that all of a sudden you you become closer in your relationship you know and it goes also the other way where sometimes we'll do a favor for somebody mm -hmm. and you know the other day um i was looking for this one machine it's called a tornos machine and I called up my friend, this is a Swiss guy in, in uh, California, this guy named Jan. Probably shouldn't be people using people's real names, but why not? And two, about a year ago, uh, I tried to sell him these machines, um, these three older machines from a factory that was like right next to him in California. And um, I, I told him about these machines because he said he needed it. And... Um, and then he kind of negotiated for them. And then the seller wasn't going to go down with it. And anyways, he knew where the machines were. And by the time it got to the end, we weren't going to make any money on it. It was like, even everything was <laughs> the same price, you know, and I, we could have just been like, all right, we'll fine, go buy them directly. But for some reason, he wanted to do it through us. It, it was like less complicated for him maybe to do it through us because they were coming from a competitor or somebody or whatever. So we did the they, we we did the deal for free. We processed the whole thing. Then this week, a guy was looking for one of those machines that we sold him. We sold him three. I called him. I said, "You have one of them. Maybe you want to get rid of. You know, you weren't even crazy about getting all three. And he said, "Yeah, actually." Yeah, I think I can part with one, the, the worst one, but still like, um, and there we go, you know, the whole reciprocity. Uh, and I think you're totally right about uh, helping people, asking people for help. And that goes back to the bomb, you know, like you need help from somebody. You don't know until you try. 
Right. And one, one thing I found, at least what I've observed being on the receiving end of sometimes request, a lot depends too. If, if you make a request, that's a, what I, let's call it for lack of a better term, a humble request. Like I'm just asking if you can help me with X that's different than when it's, when it, it's kind of like a, a, a hidden demand in the form of a request, because I have an expectation. We've known each other a long time. I've helped you on three deals. Why aren't you helping me on this deal? Um, that, you know, that just creates a whole different emotion back, you know, coming back at you. So I think if you, if you go out into the world and, and look, it does stink when you've helped somebody and then you're, you're looking for the favor back and they don't, but you know. it does. Right. Well, and, and sometimes just, it's, you know, I, I look at it kind of uh, this way, maybe uh, just interested if, if you see it this way, that sometimes it is a pay it forward kind of thing. In other words, if I'm always looking to be helpful in the world, I know that the people I help not down to the individual won't all be able to reciprocate, won't be able to, maybe not want to, yeah. but in the long run, I have found a lot of kindness and goodness coming back my way just by being out there in the world a certain way. Absolutely. That, that is, and that's something I, I try to remind myself, you know, give more. Um, some people are just takers and that's sure. just the way they think. Um, and, and you always wonder how do these people stay in business so long? And some of them do, they, they just know how to do it. But um, yeah, I find if you can give in the right way, do the right kind of favors, it will come back. And it's to say, it goes the same other way. If you, if you're a jerk to somebody and you, you know, we, we, we tried to, uh, help a guy with a machine. He asked for a machine. We knew where the machine was. We said, give us a commission. If you go and buy this machine, we didn't, we could have tried to, you know, be the middleman and do all this right. stuff. We decided, Hey, if you go to this machine, if, if you buy this machine, we want a $10,000 commission. He said, yep, I will. Later on, we find he bought the machine. Call him up. The, he hasn't cut the check. First, he avoids our call. Okay. Then we call him up again and we find him and we remind him. And he says, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. You know, then, he, then he's MIA. We had already done a deal with this guy, a great deal. He, we're not going to do any more deals with him. Right. And if anybody asks me about him, I'm not going to say he's a criminal. There's only a few people you'd say that about. But I'm going to say not a big fan. Right. Right. No, no, Long absolutely. Game. And that, and that does what go, you know, the old saying, what goes around comes around uh, is, is a true statement. No, this has been a really interesting. And I think uh, for me, I, I love this, this, this line of thinking. It's I hate to say, hate, hate to end on that negative one. No, but. well, the, the, the uh, well, the good news is there's many more people not like that person. I, I have found in business. I think you have as well. So he stands out by being the exception. Let's go with that. Yeah. And I uh, agree because if you just come into this world thinking everybody's going to cheat you, um, you're not going to do anything. You might as well not leave the house oh, yeah. or. Yeah. Well, that's, there are people that won't leave their house because they're, you know, you can't, you can't go into the world fearful. You, you do need to be aware. Like, like I tell my kids when in the city, I said, you got to like head on a swivel, be situationally aware. Um, but you also enjoy where, you, yeah. you know, if you're walking down the streets of New York, enjoy it because it's, a, it's something to be enjoyed. Yeah. And, I, and now I'm going to go down a totally different rabbit hole, but I just, you know, one of the great things about the United States um, is you know, our law and order, you know, people, people throw that around. Yeah. Oh, what are you talking about? Our system is crap. Yeah. But if you go to Russia, um, they have no law and order over there. It's all just mafia or, or whatever. Right. So the key, they say one of the keys to having a great economy is law and order. Mm -hmm. So there you go. I mean, that's, that's part of the reason why I, I think, People are instinctively good, but at the same time, they also, I think that's another great thing about our country, which is a reason why it's so good for business. Absolutely. Yeah, look, I mean, I've, I've, I've had value prop. I've, I founded it 17 years ago and I've dealt with 
so many different business owners over that time. And I've never had an experience. I've had, you know, not everything has been like, you know, like, uh, like uh, walking through the daisies, but I've never had anybody like not honor their contract. You know, like, you know, it's just been straight up, you know? So like, that's been my experience by and large, most people would rather do the right thing, but your point is right. But we live in a system where that's kind of the expectation that you're going to do. It's the expectation. (laughs) It's the expectation. Right. And that changes. It's like paying taxes. It's our expectation here. It's so weird. We hate them, but we do in this country. But you do. Absolutely. Well, Noah, if somebody listening to this wanted to know more about you, maybe your podcast and yeah. your business, just tell us where they would find that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, first, you know, our business, if you're looking for buying and selling any uh, used turning equipment, um, that's Graph Pinkert. Um you just Google us, uh, our, our website, um, for our blog about the precision machining industry is today's machining And, um, if you're into podcasts and I'm assuming people listening to this are into podcasts, oh, we talk about a lot of the same things I'm talking about today. Um, go to Swarfcast. That's S W A R F as in Frank. And then, uh, C A S T Swarfcast. Fantastic. And we'll have that in our show notes as well. But no, thank you for being a guest on business. This was so much fun. You're a great interviewer. Thank you. Well, thank you.